Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's my great pleasure to welcome you to another seminar within the context of the War Crime Research Group series of the War Studies Department. Today, we're extremely happy and honored to have Professor Jennifer Trahan from NYU, uh, who is going to talk about her last book on the existing legal limits to the Security Council veto in the face of atrocity crimes. Before I start the, our discussion with Jennifer, I would like to briefly introduce her, not that she needs a long introduction. So uh, Jennifer is a clinical professor at NYU Center for Global Affairs, where she directs their concentration, I'm sorry, in international law and human rights. She has published, she's one of the most prolific writers, scholars, uh, with many review articles and book chapters on the topics of international criminal law, international justice in general, including on the very interesting international criminal course, Crime of Aggression. Her the last book we are going to discuss today was awarded the uh, Book of the Year Award of 2020 by the American branch of the International Law Association, where also Jennifer serves as one of the US representatives to the Committee of the International Law Association regarding the use of force. Uh, additionally, uh, Jennifer has served as an amicus courier before the International Criminal Court on the appeal of the situation regarding Afghanistan. And she also serves on the Council of Advisors on the application of the Rome Statute to cyber warfare. Now, uh, after this uh, sort of uh, introduction, today we are going to discuss uh, with uh, Jennifer her last book about the existing legal limits to the Security Council veto power in the face of atrocity crimes. So, Jennifer, if I can, uh, if we can, uh, um, uh, if we can initiate this discussion, I would like to to ask you: How do you identify what is the main problem with the exercise of veto power by the Security Council that you identify in your book? Yeah. And thank you very much and welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much, Maria, for that introduction. And thank you also for inviting me to be part of this speaker series. Um, I'm honored to be uh, speaking at King's College London War Studies Department. Um, so yeah, my book starts by identifying a problem. And um, I shorthand um, is vetoes in the face of atrocity crimes. I mean, atrocity crimes to be genocide, war crimes, crimes against humanity. So if we look back historically, we can see that the US, the UK and France used their veto related to apartheid South Africa. It didn't result in complete paralysis of the council because there was eventually mandatory chapter seven sanctions imposed, but it likely delayed the dismantlement of apartheid. In Rwanda, it was somewhat different. We have veto threats. The word genocide must not be used. Um, there were, and again, it is those same uh, three countries. Um, the fear is they're then triggering an obligation and the need to do something and here, there's also simply the unwillingness. It's not that the veto is blocking intervention. There wasn't willingness to try to intervene to stop the genocide. So it's operating somewhat differently. Regarding Darfur, Sri Lanka, and Myanmar, it's really more the veto threat. And the veto threat can act just as effectively as the veto. It can absolutely shut down discussion. Um, and in, in the world doesn't really know why. Why is the council being so passive in the face of massive atrocity crimes? So for instance, in Darfur, we see accelerating uh, war crimes, crimes against humanity, and the crimes have even been charged as genocide with a death toll eventually of 450,000. And the Security Council, meanwhile, because of the veto threats of China, is weakening <laughs> sanctions. It's weakening the mandate for the deployment of peacekeepers. And we have a very delayed deployment of a hybrid force um, due to the veto threats. Regarding Myanmar, again, it's mainly veto threats. We do have one actual veto in 2007. 2007, the rest of the council was ready to uh, condemn the crimes being committed. 
And the problem is when you can't even get out the condemnation, you know the council won't be able to ratchet up to other measures. And it also sends a proverbial green light to perpetrators on the ground. You can't even be condemned. You have a protector on the Security Council. So it's more harmful than just that one resolution failing. Um, regarding Syria, we have a very dispiriting uh, list of 15 vetoes. Some are double vetoes. Um, thereby Russia, uh, sometimes joined by China. They prevent recognition of crimes and condemnation of crimes. They block referral to the International Criminal Court. They block a variety of measures related to chemical weapons use, including a chemical weapons inspection regime known as the Joint Investigative Mechanism. And when that was first imposed, there actually was a decrease in veto use. So these um, inspection mechanisms seem to have been alleviating some of the attacks, lessening fatalities. And then when we have the three vetoes actually of the renewal of the mechanism, you have accelerated um, chemical weapons attacks. So here on this one, I do think we can draw a fairly direct correlation between the veto on the East River and fatalities on the ground in Syria. And we even have blockage of humanitarian assistance, for instance, to Aleppo under siege. So um, the, I put all together, I think it's very clear that these vetoes are costing lives. Um, and um, these are all situations, note that we would have nine other members of the council ready to impose some other measures. So you, nine is a required number, otherwise for something to pass within the council. So the rest of the council has some measures they would like to, um, to try to prevent or alleviate the commission of atrocity crimes and the veto is being the blockage there. Thank you very much, Jennifer, for this initial introduction, for uh, identifying, for setting up the, the main question of, of your book. Now, uh, my second question would be, how, how do you address that problem, this problem from a legal uh, perspective? What is your response? How do you think that this problem, legally speaking, could be addressed? And this, uh, I assume this is a question that many, many of our participants, you know, they have in your mind. Yeah. Uh, yes. Thank you. Thank you. And sorry, I think I left the US off the list. I don't mean the US to be off the list. The US also frequently uses this veto uh, related mainly to Israel. And I do mean to address any veto in the face of atrocity crimes. Um, so what do I propose to do about this? So I'm trying to, in my book, take a critical look at the legality of this practice. And the veto is found in Article 27.3 of the UN Charter. So I have three independent legal arguments, and I do kind of mean them hierarchically. So if we find the veto in the Charter, we actually have above the Charter the notion of use covens. So that's my first set of arguments. My second is based on the remainder of the Charter. What else does the Charter obligate? And then my third series of arguments relate to treaty obligations, such as Genocide Convention and Geneva Convention obligations. So, and please know I'm here giving like the three minute version. So my arguments are about 120 pages in my book. So um, the full version can be found there. Um, so briefly, the first argument used Kogan. So we say genocide, war crimes, crimes against humanity are all protected at this very highest level of the law. So what does it then mean? It, and it seems that how we're reading the veto is, you know, absolute carte blanche. We have, you know, no qualms about how or when it's used um, and, you know, no questions asked. Um, it's just this absolute fiat and we really don't care what is the context. Well, I say at minimum it's inconsistent to read this obligation found in the charter, which is lower on the hierarchy of norms than the protections that we say, you know, that genocide, war crimes, crimes against humanity are protected at the very highest level of law. At minimum, it's inconsistent. A more aggressive formulation is our veto sometimes seems to facilitate these, these crimes. Another way of formulating this first argument is it reaches um, the articles of responsibility of states for internationally wrongful acts 
The ILC in Article 41.1 recognizes a duty of states to cooperate to bring to an end through lawful means any serious breach of an obligation arising under a peremptory norm of general international law. So if you're vetoing in the face of these crimes, you're, it, it does not appear that you are cooperating to try to end um, the commission of these crimes. So those are kind of my three ways of formulating my first argument. The second argument looks at the UN Charter, which is framed by its purposes and principles. So the Charter in Article 1 says we need to respect international law, human rights, and cooperate in solving problems of a humanitarian character. And in Article 2, it talks about the Charter being um, uh, respected and obligations under it observed in good faith. And good faith is generally required under international law. So, you know, how do these vetoes measure up to these requirements? And note Article 24.2 of the Charter says the Council uh, as a whole is bound by the Charter. So if the Council as a whole is bound, individual permanent members can't have greater powers. So they, they must be bound as well. But they're also bound because states are bound by the terms of the Charter and the permanent members are also states. So they're bound in that way. So they are bound to respect these obligations. Um, and this is an argument um, that one sees more often at the UN. Um, states seem more interested in this argument. Um, and it has been made that the vetoes are simply violating the UN Charter. Um, my third line of argumentation and these are pretty much phrased as independent arguments, um, looks at the Genocide Convention and uh, 1949 Geneva Conventions um, to which all permanent members are parties. Um, and is specifically uh, in the Genocide Convention, it looks at um, the obligation to prevent genocide in Article One. And in the 1949 Geneva Conventions, it looks at the obligation to ensure respect for the Geneva Conventions, which is also found in certain of the additional protocols and certain permanent members are bound to the additional protocols. So I only apply this argument to them to the extent they're parties to those protocols. So if we look at the ICJ and the Bosnia-Serbia case that shows there are serious obligations related to the obligation to prevent genocide. So um, first, um, it is triggered when there is a risk of genocide. So one does not need to wait until genocide is occurring. So this is obviously true. If you want to try to prevent atrocities, you don't need to wait till they fully manifest. So when there's a serious risk of genocide, then there is a essentially a due diligence obligation and it's based on a state's capacity to influence. So here I would argue that the permanent members have particularly strong capacity to influence by virtue of being permanent members, but they often also have bilateral relationships with the countries where the crimes are occurring and it would apply there too. And note, it's not just an obligation to prevent genocide in your own country, but the ICJ is very clear here they were adjudicating Serbia's responsibility vis-a-vis -vis genocide in Bosnia, which was at the time an independent state. Um, and they're quite clear it is an obligation that is owed externally. These same um, are basically true of common article one, the obligation to ensure respect for the Geneva Conventions. In the wall in Nicaragua cases, the ICJ says these are external obligations, again, not limited just preventing um, G Geneva Convention violations in your territory and grave breaches in your territory, but more broadly than that. And the ICRC also um, says these are due diligence obligations. So it may be really hard to define, well, what exactly is required of due diligence? Because obviously the council has some measure of discretion. You know, it can use article 40, 41 and 42 measures. And it, these are a variety of measures. So I think it's easier to say, um, the vetoes were seen, seen to be the antithesis of due diligence. For crimes against humanity, I don't make a treaty-based argument when there is a crimes against humanity treaty. Um, and I know Professor Leila Sadat will talk about this next week in your speaker series. Um, so when there is this treaty, there it is. the current draft has an obligation to prevent in it. 
I do think there is currently an obligation to prevent um, crimes against humanity, but it has to be derived from general legal obligations. It doesn't have a similar treaty source. So I think there are clear legal arguments to be made and states need to invoke these. They need to use these at the UN. Anytime it seems that a veto or a veto threat is coming, they need to use these legal arguments to try to stave this off States could also work towards trying to have a general assembly resolution issued, recognizing some of these existing legal limits to use of the veto, or they could send this to this um, International Court of Justice uh, for an advisory opinion on a question such as, is all veto use while there's ongoing or the serious risk of genocide, crimes against humanity or war crimes consistent with international law? So they really could tee up this question and ask the ICJ um, about the current state of practice. Uh, thank you very much once more. Um, I found particularly interesting the, the call, the idea of the advisory opinion, you know, and I was thinking uh, very much uh, Beth's uh, last week's uh, presentation speaking about imagining and creativity uh, and to be able, you know, to utilize, to instrumentalize all the methods and the means, you know, that, that, that we have as, as lawyers. Uh, having said that, if I can take a little bit, if I exercise my my, uh, my my authority here as, as a chair, uh, I was wondering what are your thoughts, you know, if we move from this general framework uh, to, to more case specific uh, situations. And I'm, I'm, I'm asking about Syria, for example, because I know that uh, many of our uh, attendees and myself as well uh, wonder how do you think, you know, that your legal proposition, you know, could apply hypothetically in, in the Syrian scenario? Thank you. Yeah, um, so the Syria vetoes, um, I, I think have really, um, you know, called out that we really need to do something about this. And I think that the frustration at the UN was absolutely palpable and really agonized speeches by some of the permanent members and elected members on the council um, where these vetoes happen and they're incredibly distressing. I mean, if we focus, for instance, just on blockage of the referral of the situation to the International Criminal Court, um, and that was a double veto um, by Russia and China. And at the time of the, the blockage of that referral, you had in the, it's the May 22, 2014, you had already had the huge chemical weapons attack in the Al Ghuda region, the sarin gas attack with thought to have killed over a thousand with 3000 suffering from neurotoxic symptoms. The Independent International Commission of Inquiry on the Syrian Arab Republic had already found a huge number of war crimes and crimes against humanity by government forces and affiliated militias, and then war crimes as well by anti-government forces. So a huge laundry list of incredibly dispiriting crimes, including deliberate targeting medical personnel in hospitals, denying medical access, destroying cultural heritage, laying siege to towns in order to make conditions of life unbearable. It's, it's a horrible read to, to read the, the agonized reports of the Independent International Commission of Inquiry uh, of these crimes occurring. So in the face of um, you know, we, we, I, I won't read the long list, but it's about, you know, t 20 suspected war crimes and, you know, it, it, 10 suspected crimes against humanity, huge numbers of crimes by a number of parties, you then have blockage of the referral. So you have basically, there's no jurisdiction over your situation as a whole. So what does this do here? Um, if there could have been any deterrence created, absolutely squandered, because it's saying to perpetrators, there now is no jurisdiction over the crimes as a whole. And jurisdiction for the crimes as a whole, what would have, it would have meant the International Criminal Court could have looked at the whole situation and analyzed who are our worst perpetrators, what are our worst crimes, and brought those cases. Um, instead, where we are, Beth is right, we need creativity, but unfortunately, where we are now is the IIIM gathering the evidence um, together and really waiting for individual perpetrators to walk into countries that will exercise jurisdiction. Um, it means there can be some cases against isolated perpetrators, but what it deprives you of is looking at the worst crimes and the worst crime 
and worst perpetrators and kind of doing a methodical approach to accountability. And if people wanted um, the, the atrocities against the Yazidis uh, told by a tribunal at large, that was also squandered because the ICC could have done these cases. Um, and again, what is happening is, yes, there will be isolated ISIL trials within Europe, but a lot of ISIL are being tried in the region. They're tried on quick trials, and they're often tried for terrorism charges. So they might have been um, implicated in atrocities vis-a-vis -vis the Yazidi in the genocide against this Yazidi, but they're largely being tried in very brief trials, um, no due process, and many quickly executed. Um, so not only do I believe that is, that is wrong to begin with, but it is also not depriving us of being able to focus on these crimes in one tribunal. Yes, there may be isolated cases. So that has been the harm of that one veto, which I think you need to measure against these legal obligations and say there are, were legal problems with that veto. And in it, I'll just um, say briefly that in addition to the three arguments I outlined, because related to atrocity crimes, there are additionally obligations to investigate and prosecute crimes. There are additional legal arguments that can be made specifically when we have blockage of a referral. Thank you, Jennifer. Uh, I, I can see I stopped collecting questions uh, for the attendees. <clears throat> excuse me, for the attendees. I'm saying that, you know, you know I'm, I'm, I'm doing lots of questions. Uh, but I have one more question, if I may ask you before, you know, I, I go. I was thinking, uh, how do you, um, how can I say, how do you assess, you know, your, your proposition with regard to R2P and the discussion uh, surrounded uh, R2P, the critique, the confusion, to what extent it is a legal doctrine, can we talk, whether it has changed anything, uh, the initial idea about the veto, you know, that it was coming from the Committee of State Sovereignty and your thoughts about that, and then I promise I'll, I'll yeah, so um, these ideas of looking critically at the veto, um, I look, my book really focused on the legal questions, but the original Canadian convened commission, International Commission on Intervention and State Sovereignty, they also saw that we need veto restraint for R2P to be able to work. So one of our early calls for veto restraint is actually in 2001, it's in the, the, the first um, important R2P report um, by, by the commission. Um, and they recognize um, that only then are we going to be able you know, to have R2P work. And then this is really echoed in calls by the S5, small five group of states. Um, they propose resolutions. Then we, and there are a variety of proposals for veto restraint. Um, and um, the two most prominent ones we have today are the French Mexican Initiative, joined by 105 states, and the ACT Code of Conduct, joined by 122 states, all calling with different formulations for some measure of veto restraint. So we do have broad recognition the veto is a problem. The veto is a problem in terms of R2P. It's blocking R2P. Where was R2P in Syria? I would say it was blocked by the veto. Simple answer. Um, so we do have calls for restraint, but where it gets us um, is, and I think it's important two of the P5 have endorsed voluntary veto restraint because France leads the French Mexican initiative and both France and the UK are parties to the code of conduct. But the US, uh, Russia and China are not. So when three of the P5 don't endorse any veto restraint, we have no veto restraint. So I would say um, R2P, um, is, is entirely being blocked um, now by the veto. Um, and I didn't know if you were also asking about um, humanitarian intervention, um, the question because I know the UK is still also bullish on a humanitarian intervention. It's something I also talk about in my book. Do we still have a doctrine of humanitarian intervention? Um, and where is it in related to, relationship to R2P? And of course we started with 
you know, the Kosovo intervention, which seemed maybe the high point of humanitarian intervention. Um, and although the, the international community basically coming out with it was morally justified, if not strictly legal, so they kind of really hedge on the legality formulations. And that's kind of why we go into the development of R2P. And the first pronouncement on R2P, the Canadian one, is, is maybe the, the best in my mind, because it says, you know, if the council isn't acting, don't be surprised if others do. So I think they leave a little opening for regional actors, or even in horrific situations, you know, maybe a, a state acting alone. But then later reports seem to shut that down. And they just say, no, we need the Security Council to, to exercise RTP. So that kind of brings us back to, well, what if the Security Council is paralyzed by vetoes? And that's where we, I think we are. And I know the UK still claims there is a doctrine of humanitarian intervention joined by Denmark. The US and France seem to have endorsed this. Um, the US with 27 um, strikes into Syria um, in, in response to chemical weapons use. And then 2018, we have US, UK and French strikes. They seem to be acting in a doctrine of humanitarian intervention without the US and France explicitly articulating this, but it's certainly not the entirety of the international community. And why do we get to this difficult place? Because the council is paralyzed. So I think we wouldn't get to having to make these humanitarian intervention stretches and arguments if we didn't have security council paralysis. And going way back to Kosovo, you know, if we didn't, you know, if they hadn't faced a presumptive veto by Russia and possibly China as well, you know, they could have gone to the council for authorization for the Kosovo intervention, knowing it would face a veto. Of course, they didn't. So um, if we chip away at the legality, we actually might be solving, um, you know, the problem with how R2P is blocked today. Um, and then those who want to kind of go around and use humanitarian intervention, I think we potentially don't have to reach these difficult questions if we just had the council um, and the charter functioning, I think as design, because I would argue already in 1945, when they created the veto power, um, they made it subject to the UN's purposes and principles. And even in 1945, there were, um, early notions of use Kogan's. So even in 1945, they didn't create a veto absolutely unlimited. If you go back to the charter negotiations, there's nothing about vetoes in the face of atrocity crimes. It was really to have unanimity in decisions to use force. And you know the whole field of IJ didn't really exist in 1945. Um, so they didn't really reach all these questions today. But I think it's really important as one considers this also to reflect, you know, we're not bound by a 1945 reading of the UN Charter. It's the Charter as it has, as situated within our system of international law as it exists today. Indeed, thank you. Thank you, Jennifer, reminding us of the UN Charter as a living instrument. And having said that, I can see in the Q&A, we have about eight questions. If it's okay, I suggest make two rounds of questions, if it's okay with you. So I'm trying to to put them together, to pair them. There are, there are two questions dealing, asking particularly about China, you know, and the question is how is the Security Council currently dealing with, with China? And uh, the, the the situation uh, with uh, let atrocities taking place in China, and there is a, a a question that is tied up to this one, asking that even if legally the Security Council uh, operates, to what extent politically? You see, it comes back, you know, to what extent politically that could be feasible. Uh, there is a second question, uh, uh, which is about your third legal argument, uh, which is uh, about the legal obligations deriving from particular international treaties and how is that related to the famous 103 article of the UN Charter. And uh, if I can add, can I add one more question, if that's okay? The, the third question is, is about uh, the, since state parties to the UN, they confer authority, you know, to the Security Council. Uh, the question is to what extent, you know, uh, in order for the Security Council to act on their behalf, uh, to what extent do you think that the misuse of the veto power could be understood as a breach of this principal agent uh, relationship? And I stop here. Great. 
Um, perfect, thank you. So I'm afraid to say in the first question, I'm very pessimistic. How is the council going to address the atrocities in, um, occurring against the Weaver? Um, I, I think in the same way they address the atrocities related to uh, Sri Lanka, Myanmar, and largely Darfur by inaction, by inattention, um, potentially not even having meetings, um, and being, you know, abdicating responsibility. Um, I, I'm very pessimistic. Um, yeah, you know, the the China, China's veto, um, and here I actually hope the other members have the courage to put resolutions uh, to the council so that China has to use the veto and the world can see, you know, the problem of the veto power. How China usually deals with it is a veto threat. And because of China's significant economic um, weight and countries' bilateral relationships with China, they seem un unwilling to do the right thing and they, they don't push these awkward questions to China. So they don't you know, propose a uh, Myanmar tribunal. Um, when they know there will be a veto. I wish they would. I wish they would put some of these, you know, um, put resolutions condemning the crimes against the Uyghur, make China veto, and then the world will see um, what is happening. Um, so it's very frustrating, the veto threat. I think, you know, um, uh, it's not necessarily picked up in the media and one, you know, doesn't understand why the council, and then it looks like the whole UN system is dysfunctional. Um, it looks like the council is dysfunctional, um, when in fact, you might have 14 other members on the council who actually want to say something, um, or 13, or, a, 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 you know, at least more than nine or more um, that it could pass. Um, Article 103 of the UN Charter, yeah, that actually says the obligations um, under, um, um, I, I have it, the charter here, so let me get it right. Um, basically, it suggests that charter obligations can trump other obligations, um, and I do have, I do discuss it in my, I do um, account for this in my book, I, I didn't in today's shorthand version of the remarks, um, and I basically um, argue that yes, um, but within limits, um, you know, the council even in it, like a chapter seven um, resolution, the council doesn't, it, it has certain constraints. We wouldn't expect the council to be violating fundamental rules like distinction and proportionality if it authorized a military intervention. You know, we, you know, we wouldn't expect the council to authorize genocide. So even under chapter seven, um, the security council is not above all law. And these are very, very fundamental norms that I'm talking about when I talk about genocide and war crimes, crimes against humanity. And I think the 103 needs to be read in that. Line. The third um, question um, in the Q&A, um, I absolutely agree. It is something I've also written. Um, members confer responsibility on the council to act on their behalf. Um, yeah, are they really acting um, on the behalf of states? Um, absolutely, it is a breach of, um, you know, the privilege of the veto. Others write it, we could, the phrase abuse of rights, abuse de droit, um, you can, and, you know, it's a privilege of the veto. Absolutely, it is a power conferred um, by the other members to act on their behalf. Is that what they're doing with their vetoing chemical weapons inspections? I don't think so. The referral resolution um, to the ICC of the crimes in Syria, I think was, co-sponsored by 66 or 67 UN member states. Um, no, the council is clearly not acting on their behalf. So the third question um, I actually do also write about. Here, I know too many questions for you. Excellent, thank you so much. Uh, so we can proceed with the second, uh, many, many interesting questions. I see a very interesting question from my colleague, uh, Dr. Natasha Kurd. So uh, Natasha uh, questions asks about authority, you know, the issue of authority. So if one can decide the genocide, he says, or crimes against humanity are occurring, or, or there is a risk of occurring, don't we still have the problem of who should intervene and under whose mandate, which is that also prevents uh, action? 
uh, so it's an issue of authority. Uh, there is question. There is one question about um, about Syria again. Uh, um, I guess uh, why Russia and China are so against uh, anything about Syria. Um, uh, there is uh, another question about the duty to prevent. Uh, one of our attendees, uh, which uh, questions ask why you know it's not uh, clearly uh, identified in the Geneva Conventions, and then. Should I stop here and then call? Yeah, maybe stop there. Thank you. Yes, yes. <laughs> so um, the first question, if genocide and crimes against humanity are occurring, who would intervene? So I guess I'm still um, thinking that we need to operate within um, the framework uh, of the charter system. So I'm not suggesting we're going beyond the charter system. Um, I, I'm just questioning the legality of some of these vetoes. Um, first, I'm not, my book is not mainly making a case for intervention. Um, in terms of large scale military interventions, I don't think they've gone that well in many of our instances. So um, a lot of the measures that have been vetoed are lesser. Um, and, but I'm saying this is really the start of the problem if you can't condemn crimes. Um, in Darfur, um, it was weakening sanctions, you know, on the government of Sudan. Um, you needed an oil embargo if you really wanted to, to um, put pressure on the government of Sudan, which was committing um, the part of the, um, the crimes um, through its air power because the Janjaweed were on horseback and they were doing the crimes um, at, at, the, um, at that level with, um, and this is, so all of the air flights and bombardment um, by the Sudanese aren't necessarily the Sudanese military. If you had really wanted to um, put constraints on, it would have needed an um, you know, oil embargo. Um, and then even when they had an arms embargo, at first it exempted the government and then they just never enforced it. So um, I'm not really one making a case for large scale military interventions and saying that the council has a variety of tools at its disposal and needs to rash it up and use these. Um, and it is still primarily, I'm addressing the council doing this. I'm not really making a case for doing this outside the council system, um, but I'm trying to make um, the council function um, more effectively um, if, if we kind of try to block some of these vetoes and then it puts, you know, more of an onus on, you know, the other members of the council to propose to propose measures and even when they're um, ev even military intervention, there can be um, limited military interventions. So before you would reach um, large scale military intervention. Um, Maria, you took down the second question, and I'm now forgetting it. Remind me, what was my second question? Yes, Sorry. <laughs> uh, yes I have to scroll up. Oh, no. Uh, why Russia and China? Yeah. I remember. Yeah. Um, are, are really, um, so on Syria, I mean, you know, Russia is involved in the situation. Um, it, and it is extremely strong ties to the Assad regime. So um, Russia sees this as a, an important strategic interest uh, to prop up the Assad regime and help the Assad regime win the war. I mean, Russia is actually involved in the situation. Um, any China vetoes, I think, are more, um, you know, not wanting to see aggressive measures against atrocity crimes, um, not necessarily because related to the serious situation, but not wanting to see aggressive measures against atrocity crimes, because that maybe would set the foundation for similar aggressive measures related to Myanmar or the Uyghur. So I think for China, it's more, um, you know, oh, sovereignty, we must, you know, um, uh, um, is, is so there, but, but Russia, and just to go back um, for any historians in the audience to go back to the drafting, one of the real contentious issues in the drafting of the charter, and I have a chapter on this in my book, is that in the early negotiations, and the veto, the veto was negotiated between Stalin, Churchill, and FDR, right? It's, it's really very, very high level. Um, at Yalta, at Dumbarton Oaks, China somewhat also brought in, but it's mainly the three discussing, and they are then in the negotiations calling it the principle of unanimity. And the UK and the US strongly felt if a country was involved in the situation, it shouldn't have the veto. 
And wouldn't we have a different charter system if they had prevailed on that? So, and it's Stalin saying, no, no, even chapter seven across the boards and P5 involved in the situation, they have the veto. And they, they ended up going with the, the USSR approach to the veto when they got to San Francisco. So, um, so here um, we're not really surprised by the Russian vetoes. Um, uh, related to Syria, and as I say, um, China, I think it's it's for really other reasons. Um, and then the last question was, um, why don't we have a specific duty to prevent um, in the Geneva um, Conventions? I haven't specifically focused on this. Um, there is a general obligation to ensure respect, and the, even the 1949 ones have grave breaches and common Article Three violations. So ensuring respect to me implies you try to ensure these crimes do not occur. Um, I don't know that I can hinge it precisely on kind of the same language. Um, that we see in the genocide convention. But I think the same notion can possibly be derived um, also from the Geneva Conventions. Wow, that was so rich. I do, I mean, I, can you still, uh, can we do it one? I mean, absolutely, very okay, happy to. Wonderful, wonderful, because I don't, want, I don't want to overburden you, but there are so many questions and very interesting questions from the attendees. Uh, so uh, I think one set of questions is very much related, you know, uh, around the veto um, idea. So there is a question which asks, to what extent do you think if the veto rights are taken away, uh, could that lead to some states pulling out of the UN altogether? And um, there is another question, uh, which is about, it's more critical question, uh, uh, the, the attendee asked, if by focusing very much on limiting the veto power, actually uh, that hinders the possibility to focus on broader and more structural Security Council reforms. Uh, and uh, also there is a question which goes back to um, when we have a violation you know, of, the, of a legal framework, uh, what does that mean for the normativity of the legal framework, such as the genocide conventions, when it is vetoed in the Security Council? So I, I can stop here if that's okay yeah, with you. Yeah, sure. Um, so I don't think the veto is going to be taken away. Yes, um, it, it is in the UN Charter. Um, I'm arguing for looking at what international law has to say about the veto and reading it in light of the obligations of international law. It is in the UN Charter. So um, you basically don't get rid of the veto without amending the Charter. A Charter Amendment is a high majority plus agreement of all P5. So amendments are veto proof. So the veto is here to stay unless we don't have the UN. Um, so I'm not really arguing for, you know, throwing, you know, our UN system out the window. I think we work within the framework of the v UN system, and I'm not trying to argue for getting rid of the veto, but reading it in light of existing legal obligations. Um, broader reforms, um, they, there is, there's been, you know, years of debate, um, enlarging the council and a whole series of other reforms, you know, more, more permanent members, permanent members without veto, um, a huge variety of proposals. Um, you know, I don't, I don't think my initiative helps or hurts those. I mean, this is happening. There is a committee. Its nickname is the never ending committee. So um, I'm not really optimistic. Again, you know, charter reforms are veto proof. And we have individual permanent members um, saying, yeah, we would endorse this person being added, this state, sorry, this country being added, but I don't really see agreement of all permanent members on enlargement. You know, I'm not really optimistic where that is going. So, um, you know, but I think that's a separate path than my arguments. And I, I think my arguments neither have. 
what is the future of pre-existing frameworks like the genocide convention if they're being blocked? Um, well, we need to challenge this blockage. Um, you know, I've thought of an advisory opinion. I would love if we could have a contentious case. You know, I'm very inspired by the Gambia suit um, against Myanmar. Um, we do need creativity um, due to, you know, China is one of the countries with that reservation to Article Nine, uh, Article Nine of the Genocide Convention, which means it can be, it, it can't be brought to the ICJ on genocide convention breaches. So I actually think, um, and I'm going to be writing about this in my, my next piece, but um, I think we need to go re back and revisit that reservation. So I, I would like there to be a contentious case um, uh, on the veto. Um, but first, I think we have to go back and revisit that reservation. And that reservation, you know, it, it was our first advisory opinion, can you have reservations early on the ICJ it says yes. And more recently, that particular reservation was challenged by DRC against Rwanda and the ICJ upheld the reservation. But in a separate opinion, a, a number of the judges on the ICJ seem to say, you know, it's really troubling that this day and age, a country can agree not to commit to genocide, but please don't take me to court over it. Um, and really suggesting, you know, we might want to need to revisit this reservation. I actually think we need to re go back and revisit this reservation. Is it really okay to agree we agree, you know, and it's all the, the measures under the genocide convention, not only, you know, not to commit genocide, but, you know, to, to embody the responsibilities under domestic law and have, you know, trainings and, you know, all the measures um, in the genocide convention apply, but please just don't take me to court over any of them under the ICJ. Is, you know, is that still a permissible reservation? Because unfortunately that is still there. Um, and so that is blocking, um, you know, kind of an obvious kind of Gambia versus China suit over the Uyghur um, is, is blocked. Um, yeah, I, if Beth von Scott uh, last week was talking about creativity um, in, in the face of impediments, we absolutely need creativity in the face of impediments, you know, and I applaud Gambia and, um, and um, as well as the Netherlands and Canada um, intervening um, and supporting Gambia's application um, for a suit against Myanmar. And it's of course not a criminal proceeding, but it is, it is certainly um, pushing the ball forward. Um, and then we have, you know, the double I, double M gathering evidence, um, as well as um, I, I believe there is a suit in Argentina as well. Um, so, you know, a variety of measures are being approached, as well as the International Criminal Court potentially adjudicating crimes where they have an element of the crime occurred in Bangladesh. So we actually have kind of four different things occurring um, related to crimes in, in Myanmar. But, you know, the, the most direct roots are again all blocked by the veto because if we didn't have the veto what you would take is the provisional measures order from the ICJ case the provisional genocide we would take the provisional measures order and one of those countries would put it in security council resolution and take it to the security council and you just get it passed and then the ICJ's what it's, uh, what it's um, ordered to be done has the strength of the council behind that. And of course, none of this happens. Countries don't have the courage to put this to the council because they know it'll face a veto. Um, so it's again, the veto power that's really blocking uh, what we otherwise could be doing. So a lot of work needs to be done. Wow. Uh, I can ask two or, is it okay, two or more, three? Just Please, the final. Uh, the final round. I know we could uh, we could continue forever, uh, Jennifer. I mean, there are questions here regarding the role of the General Assembly, of course. You know, the uniting for peace, and to what extent, you know, uh, uh, it could be a complementary or a re replacement. There is a question that what it happens, let's say, if the ICJ, you know, uh, we have. Uh, 
what I say, if it is referred to the ICJ, that finds that its exercise was ultra virus or of the P5 veto. Um, sorry for that. I'm trying to, to see all the questions or my laptop. Um, so I think you're asking me the, the second and third questions that I'm seeing in the chat yeah. function. So let me try these. Can the General Assembly use the Uniting for Peace to, uh, you know, overcome something? Um, so my understanding of Uniting for Peace was that it was done in a period of time when the General Assembly, so one of the things Uniting for Peace did was achieve a special session which I think is less needed because the GA meets more often. Um, I don't know that Uniting for Peace actually gives the GA broader powers than it already has under the charter. So um, I don't know if we need Uniting for Peace, you could get the council or you could simply go to the GA. As it happened when the referral of the situation in Syria to the ICC was blocked, the GA took up the and created the triple IM. So you can definitely go to the GA. I don't know it gives any greater powers. So um, they, um, you know, they can, um, they primarily have um, recommendations. Um, you know, I, I'm still reading the charter fairly traditionally that any kind of force authorization still needs to go through the Security Council. So yes, you can turn to the GA and yes, you can try to do, um, you know, the, um, the GA has, you know, um, a, a fair measure of tools at its disposal and use G, the tools the GA has at its disposal. Um, but, but there are certain measures that are simply blocked by the veto. Um, what happens if we have a veto that's ultra virus? So um, what happens next is a great question. So, um, you know, I guess first I'm just arguing, you know, in the abstract, we need an advisory opinion. And that's, you know, that probably advisory opinion. And I hope to be so lucky that we could actually get there. One of the consequences would be, you know, as the question rightly poses, you know, if you're violating, you know, use Kogan's, um, it shouldn't actually be voidable, it should be void. Um, so what do we do? And, uh, um, you know, what happens on the council? Um, you know, absent a ruling in a concrete case, um, I'm afraid we might just have an advisory opinion I mean, I still think we should try to get an advisory opinion. You know, what does it do in an, you know, in the next specific situation? So ideally, I would have an advisory opinion and then we would actually have a contentious case to figure out. And then, you know, really have a declaration. Um, you know, I don't know if you could go to the ICJ for very quick provisional measures and kind of a ruling. Uh, we'd have to have a situation that can be brought. Um, you know, is this particular veto um, ultra virus? Um, and then a ruling by the court, um, yes, you know, um, or whatever, I don't know how the court will rule on this. So there's obviously, um, a range of potential rulings that could come out of the International Court of Justice. So, um, so you know, I, I can't quite foresee the future, but I'm imagining, you know, maybe the advisory opinion, and then maybe later a contentious case, a specific veto being questioned. Um, um, and uh, I, I don't know that each other, you know, uh, that's void. Um, I. I think we might actually need the, the more sound way of doing it. So, oh, thank you uh, for putting up the link to my book. Yes, of course, of course. Uh, I know many people, and uh, we we are also very much interested in in, in your book and as a, as a reading, but also as a, as a component of teaching. But but I want to ask something, if I may. Can I ask? Yes, absolutely. The last question, because I think you addressed all uh, in a kind of, with your final answer, somehow you address what happens, you know, if, if it is, if the Security Council is found to act ultra virus, you know. Um, my, my question is more general and more theoretical.
Eagle, and I'm, I was wondering, you know, as, as a writer, when you were writing and you were focusing on the legal existing, on the legal limits, you know, how did you find this interaction with, with politics, with, uh, between international law politics, and if I can say ethics as well? So I'm curious as an academic, you know, to ask you, how did you address all these issues? Because I'm writing on international law, but I see all the time, you know, and also that was very um, obvious from the kind of questions you had, you know, that it was this mixture of yeah this. absolutely i i agree with you well i i said i'm in new york and when i go over to the un uh which i used to do periodically pre-covid um that there's a large measure of politics going on it is just absolutely obvious and i think you know we all we all see that and i also teach basic international law and I don't just teach international law in a vacuum, but international law within a context. It's a mixture of the law and, and then the political component, um, and often the law trying to push back against the political component. And it's, it's difficult because I'm obviously trying to look at um, what are often seen as just very political questions, you know, isn't it all politics and, um, in, a, in a real legal framework. So taking a, a, a very um, political body, um, the Security Council and subjecting it to legal scrutiny, but, you know, we're lawyers, so that's what we do. Um, you know, I don't operate so much in the realm of, of politics as well, how does this measure up to, to legal scrutiny? And I think you're, you're right, it also raises um, all kinds of moral and ethical questions. You know, as I say, um, you know, if you read some of the statements after the Syria vetoes, um, you know, raising my book launch events, I had Mohammed Al Abdallah of Syrian Justice Accountability Center speaking of, of what was going on in Syria area on the ground um, to the people and and you really convinced uh, of the harm um, and there really is sometimes a, a direct linkage between the vote within the council and fatalities on the ground so i do think you're absolutely right there are moral and ethical issues here um, again i'm a lawyer so i i do the legal side of it um, but absolutely it's it's all wrapped up in one um, oh, that's no note, uh, Jennifer. I would like to thank you so much on behalf of the War Studies Department and the War Crime Research Group. Uh, it was a real pleasure and it was a real honor to have you uh, to discuss with you your last book. You can find on the on the chat the link of Jennifer's uh, last book uh, to respond to all the questions. We had more than. Uh, almost 15 questions, you know, and, and, and you managed to respond to all of them. And yes, international law is a curious mixture and teaching international law, it, it is a challenging uh, task, I can say that. Uh, thank you so much for this extremely rich and intriguing and thought provoking um, uh, discussion. Uh, it's a discussion that goes beyond the, the usual political limits to the Security Council. It's a legal discussion. And I hope that we will have the chance in the near future to see you, uh, to meet in person again, uh, whether in New York or in London or in Salzburg or in The Hague or somewhere else. And uh, we look forward to your next pieces of work uh, that you, <laughs> you briefly uh, mentioned. And once more, thank you very, very much for being with us uh, this morning from New York afternoon uh, in London. Thank, thank you so much, Maria. It was an absolute delight. Thank you. I, I look forward to seeing you next time in person as well. <laughs> thank you all very much. Uh, once more, thank you very much, Jennifer. And uh, have a nice uh, day in New York, a nice evening for the, for the London uh, people. Thank you all. Thank you, Danny, thank you very much for accommodating once more. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Thank Bye -bye. you. Thank you.